Good morning, Parkside. How's everybody doing? It is good to see you. My name is Matt Robinson. I'm the discipleship minister. And I know that we haven't closed church. You all have been the church for the past three months. You've been the church in your neighborhood and community. But something feels good about being together here with our church family to worship today. I'll let you know that, that our staff is going to be wearing our masks as we're walking around. But while we're on the stage and when we're talking with you, we'll have our masks off. We, we moved the rows back a little bit further so you didn't have to worry about being in the spray zone. We really appreciate all you all are doing to help make this a safe place uh, for us to connect and share God's love, being in a place where we can find Jesus and, and find family. I know some of you are here for the first time, so we want to say welcome. If you haven't been to the, the front desk, the welcome desk in the lobby, be sure you go there. I just want to let you know a few things that you can do uh, to help us keep this a safe place. Uh, one of those is you should have picked up a communion packet as you came in. The communion packet is in a Ziploc bag. You can grab that. It's got the wafer and the juice in there. And also this morning, it also has a ballot. We're going to be voting on our new elders, on our bylaws, um, and we really appreciate you doing that and the budget too. So we are not going to be passing the communion today. You'll need to grab that from one of the tables. We also won't be collecting offering today. If you look around the room, you can see some green dots by the exits. This is by each of those green dots. I feel like a stewardess on an airline. All right. You can uh, place the offering or the ballots in those boxes or any other comment cards that you've got with that. And then the last thing, it's going to feel unnatural, but at the end of the service, if you can help us uh, leave in a quick manner, it's going to be really tempting for us to just hang out and talk in here, but we need to make sure that we clean the facility and also that we don't slip into unsafe habits of hanging out and being in here. So really appreciate all, all your help with that. I also want to welcome our church that's not in the building this morning, the church that's streaming with us on YouTube and Facebook this morning. We're streaming the 11 o'clock service. If there's ever a morning that you're not feeling good or a week that you go, you know what, I've been around somebody that maybe, you know, tested positive, you can still stream our weekend services, our children's ministry services as well. Uh, you can do that online and we'll be streaming the, the 11 o'clock service now and hopefully more later. Got just a couple things I wanna let you know before we start to worship this morning. Back-to-back -back supplies, uh, the list has changed. You all have done an incredible job of getting lots of supplies together for back-to-back -to -back and also for Mount Washington Elementary. The next delivery date is this Wednesday from 11 to 1. But please go online, go onto our social media or parksidechristian.com and see how the supply list has changed. It's different supplies. And there's also an opportunity to start providing brown bag lunches for an after-school reading program. That might be something that's better for uh, a small group or a few families to get together and do. If you have questions about that, you can email Rachel at rachel at parksidechristian.com or you can contact Back to Back for more info with that as well. And the last thing I want to put on your all's radar is uh, your generosity in the past three months has allowed us not just to continue supporting our international mission partners, but to make special gifts to our mission partners. And they are being hit by this COVID crisis as well. And so we have a thank you message that we received from Simi Dingra and North India Christian Mission, and I'd like you to check that out now. Thanks. Hi, my name is Simi Dingra, and I'm from North India Christian Mission. NICM has been serving from last 21 years in Punjab, Haryana and Himachal Pradesh. I want to thank Parkside Christian Church for always supporting us, always helping us, and especially during this pandemic time. Uh, with everyone's support and help, uh, we have distributed food and uh, medical supply to over to 300 families, over 300 families. And uh, moreover, we have shown the love of Christ to these poor people. And uh, thank you once again for continuing your prayer, your love, your support. Amen. Once you guys stand with us, let's worship together. I was buried beneath my 
shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing my night alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day Your mercy saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old may knew Jesus when I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name to be back together amen we serve a big God we can sing and rejoice about the glorious day he has promised us amen so sing this out together I needed rescue my sin was heavy the chains break at the way to go glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven glorious day
we thank you that you are the king of kings and we want you to hear our praises and we know that you are god we ask that your presence meet us here in this place and let us continue worshiping you it's in your name i pray amen you guys can have a seat good morning everybody i want you to see my smile my smiling face this morning and i want to say welcome to everybody who um, is watching us electronically our our facebook audience out there this morning, and in case this is your first time, you just uh, came across this service uh, somehow, I'm Bart Stever. I'm the senior minister of the Parkside Christian Church, and it is my great privilege to uh, look at some very good and important things, profound things that Jesus has to say to us this morning. They're found in a sermon that we call Sermon on the Mount, because he was up on a mountain when he spoke it, so it kind of says it all. And there are a couple of things over the past uh, couple of weeks as we've looked at a segment of what he said that he, he tells us not to do something. Last week, he told us to stop worrying. And it seems like we've got plenty to worry about these days. But he said, as far as the mundane things of life, what it takes for you to survive, relax. Don't worry about that. Don't waste your time doing that because I've got that. I will provide that for you. And then today, he tells us another thing that we should not do or stop doing, and that is... Don't judge. Here's how he says it. It's in the seventh chapter of Matthew's history. First six verses, he says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Well, who is Jesus looking at when he says that? Maybe in the audience of his day, he was looking at the religious leaders who tended to follow him around for all of his teachings, and they were known as the Pharisees. And they were really good at pointing out the sin in other people's lives, but they couldn't see it in their own. So maybe he was talking to them. Is he, is he talking to me? <laughs> you talking to me, Jesus? Is he talking to you? If you're prone to judge people, who is it that uh, brings that up from within you, this uh, spirit of judgment? What kind of person? Well, a lot of times when we do pass judgment, we don't recognize it as that. We'll say, well, you know, it's just a, a matter of I'm right and they're wrong. <laughs> so I'm not judging. I'm just stating the obvious. But we have categories of people. We place them here as acceptable and here as unacceptable. And we interact or don't interact with people or accept people or not based on those categories. We might say anybody who thinks what they think, who does what they do, who just is who they are, if it's not right according to what I say is right, then I want nothing to do with them. Sometimes it has to do with appearance. Maybe they're the wrong skin color and you know how they are. Maybe they speak the wrong language and why don't, why don't they learn how to speak English? 
Maybe they're on the wrong side of a political party. Ah, they're a Republican. They're a Democrat. They're for the president. They're against the president. All this that's going on in the country right now, as far as the protest and the upset, there's a right place to be on those issues, and there's a wrong place to be. And we can feel very strongly about those things and evaluate people ba based on whether they agree with us or not. Now, he's got the wrong bumper sticker. I don't want anything to do with him. And not only can we write them off, but it can become such a severe judgment that we condemn them and say, well, I don't know if they're going to hell or not, but I hope so. <laughs> and that's what Jesus says, that right there. Don't do that. <laughs> because not only does that make bad problems worse, in, in the lives around us and the people that you interact with and the people that you judge, but it's also very dangerous to you personally. David Kinneman and Gabe Lyons wrote a book called Unchristian, and they did an evaluation or a survey with young people, millennials and Generation Z, and they asked them, what is your opinion of Christians? If you were to select a word that is descriptive of Christ followers, what word would you use? 87% of them used the word judgmental to describe us, <laughs> those of us who follow Jesus, Christian people. Now, that may or may not be true, but if we care about engaging with people who are dubious about followers of Christ, then we should honestly assess that and say, is there some truth to that perception. And if so, what does Jesus want us to do about that? And he does want us to do something about that. Because he says it's too easy to go there as far as the realm of judgment. Far too easy for us to make that presumption. So make sure you don't. The word judge can be used in a couple of different ways. First of all, it can be used to simply discern, to understand the, the difference between things. What is the distinction between this and that? You might look at uh, a lineup of fruit and you go, okay, this is an apple and this is an orange and I see the difference between those two. That's discernment. But then judgment can also take on a legal aspect to where we declare a verdict based on the distinction that we make and maybe even pass a sentence as to guilty or not guilty. Apples I like. Oranges I despise. Every orange should be thrown in the garbage because I don't like them. And that's the judgment that Jesus says, yeah, stay away from that one. Now, there is a judgment of discernment that we need to exercise. And Jesus goes on. He says something extreme, kind of hard to understand maybe. They're down... In verse 6, when he says, Don't give dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Well, that sounds completely opposite of what he just said. Who are these people that we regard as, <laughs> as dogs and pigs? My goodness. Well, Jesus often spoke in exaggerated ways. It's called hyperbole. He would overstate something to make sure he made his point. And what he's saying there is that there are people who will not be receptive to who you are as one of my followers, and they won't be receptive to the truth of God. They may openly ridicule you. They may mock you. They may come after you. And so don't spend an, too much time trying to connect with a person like that because they're seared. They're, they're, they are sealed off. You make a judgment call, and, and you move on, and maybe somebody else down the line we we'll have an opportunity to follow up on the seed that you've planted. But staying away from judgment doesn't mean staying away from discernment. It doesn't mean that we stop thinking. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with everyone. It doesn't mean that when you disagree with something that someone has said or an opinion that they're holding to, that you have to hold your silence. We need to be discerning as people in a culture that have a culture that somewhat lost that ability we we're in a culture 
that is ready to declare that everything is morally equivalent, and it's not. We have to be able to draw distinctions and, and take the, the truth of God, the understanding of God, and use that a, a, as we observe the world and begin to, to make our way through it along a path of, of truth and what's real and what's good and what's healthy. That's when you take judgment, you exercise judgment and use it like a flashlight. I won't shine this in your eyes, but... We need to, to be people who, through, through God enabling us to do this, to recognize there, there's good and there's bad. There's, there's moral and there's, there's immoral. There's, there's sin and there's righteousness. There, there are things that are life-giving and there, there are things that are self-destructive. And there are, are different paths that we can follow. There is a path that will take you right off the cliff. You've got to recognize which one that is. And then there's a path that leads to life, and that's the path that leads to Christ, the one and only way into a relationship with God and into eternal life with Him. And so not only do we have to recognize that, but we have to use the light of discernment to share that with other people. It's totally ir irresponsible of us as Christ followers to put the truth of God in our pocket and keep it there because we're afraid that somebody's going to call us judgmental. And inevitably, that's going to happen. We can speak to someone and talk about the provision of Christ and the fact that He is the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father but by Him. We can say that in the most loving and humble way we know how, and still people will say, ah, you just judge me. And that's there's no way to avoid some of that happening. That's going to be a reaction that, that we get. But we, we do have to be very careful of the attitude that we display when we use the power of discernment and we're interacting with someone and saying, well, here's the truth of the matter. Here's where life is to be found. Here's how we step away from our self-destructive ways. There's a way that we can do that that seems hateful, <laughs> that seems condescending, that seems self-righteous and full of ourselves, or there's a way to do that, it seems that we we're, we're genuinely care about somebody. We're coming in all humility, just saying, it's not that we have all the answers, but we know what the answers are because we know the one who holds the answers and would love to tell you about him because of the wonderful difference that he's made in our lives. There are two very different attitudes that we can bring to a conversation like that that can make the difference as to whether somebody's going to receive that or not. Judgment exercised in the wrong way is when we trade the flashlight for a judge's gavel. And we pass sentence on someone who is guilty of something that we feel is worthy of our condemnation and even God's condemnation. We presume to step onto the judgment seat of God, of Christ himself. We may say to someone, because of who you are, what you do, what you think, whatever, whatever the reason is, I believe you are worthy of hell and damnation. And we may not say that to somebody, but we may think it and we may hope it, and it will certainly affect our relationship because it will disconnect us from someone in saying, I want to have no part of you. I'm going to keep my distance from you, and maybe you'll meet God, and maybe you won't, but I'm going to have nothing to do with what you, you will or you won't because I despise you. That's the gavel. And Jesus says, yeah, you need to lay that down. <laughs> that is high presumption, and you need to put that away. Don't judge or you'll be judged. In the, and then in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus said in a variety of ways and places and teachings that we can expect no mercy from God if we are not willing to extend mercy to other people. And Jesus says, you decide how you want to be measured by God. If you want to use your own personal measuring rod, the one that you use to size people up and decide whether they're, they're good or bad, in or out, 
whether they have value or not, if you want to use your standard, then that's the standard I'll use for you. And usually what it boils down to, if it's our standard, it's, it's some standard, of, it's some stringent law that we apply. You know, here, here is perfection, and here's how you have to match up to meet my standards. It's law. And God says, all right, if that's the one you want to use on others, that's the one I will use on you. Except we're going to use, if it's law, then we're going to use my law, not yours. And believe me, my measuring stick is much longer than yours. It's far more precise than yours because it is absolute perfection. And believe me, you won't get there. <laughs> Nobody can get there. But that's the one that will be used at your insistence. But the alternative to that is to use God's measure of judgment. And that is not based on law, but it's based on love, and it's based on mercy, and it's based on grace. And to say to those around us, you have supreme value, and you have value to me simply because you are an image bearer of God himself. And maybe you don't even know him yet because you don't know Christ, but even so, you have value. And I will treat you as such. And I will uh, extend to you every bit of slack that God has extended to me. What I will offer you is not judgment, but I will offer you as much understanding as I can in mercy and grace in the same way that God offers it to me. And so Jesus says, you decide. <laughs> Which standard will it be? Will it be law, which is very harsh, or will it be grace? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now, I think this got a big laugh for Jesus. Maybe when he was there in the, in the crowd, maybe he, um, he picked up a log and started heading for one of the Pharisees when he said this, and everybody started giggling. I don't know. I don't know that Jesus was a comedian, but I think that's funny. And he goes on. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all of the time there is a plank in your own eye? How can you not see what is blocking your vision? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So before you let somebody go digging around in your eye to pull something out of there that's an irritation, you want to make sure they know what they're doing. <laughs> you want to make sure that they can see clearly in order to do that, or they, they could do a lot of damage. Back in February, I was installing aluminum railings on my front porch. And uh, for the bottom post, I had to cut off the tops. They were too tall. So I had an angle grinder. And uh, it says very clearly on the box, always use eye protection with an angle grinder. Well, I had a pair of glasses on. I thought that, that ought to take care of it. And when you cut aluminum, it doesn't throw off big shards of metal. It actually creates this fine dust. So I'm cutting away, and a puff of wind comes, and it blows this aluminum dust into my face, and it gets in behind my glasses and into my eyes. So I'm blinking, and I'm thinking, okay, I, th I think I'm okay. I don't feel anything. And I went on. Well, that was Saturday. Sunday, when I got up, just before I came to church, there was a manhole cover in my eye. <laughs> This terrible pain. And I, I did everything I could. I thought, oh, I got a chunk of aluminum in my eye. So I was, you know, you pull the eyelid over the other, other eyelid and you try and get something out that way. And I got a syringe full of water and I pulled my eyelid out and I'm shooting water up under my eye and it's still there. If you were, I don't know, you probably don't remember. That Sunday, you probably wondered why I was winking at you that Sunday. I wasn't winking. Man, I was in agony that Sunday. So I went to the eye doctor the next day. And he sets me down in the chair, and I, I put my chin up on the little thing, and he gets out the equipment, the bright light that they shine, shine in your eyeball. He's got the bright light going, and he puts on the magnifying device and the scope and the whole deal. And within 15 seconds, he had flipped my eyelid back, took a Q-tip, and wiped. He said, ah, there it is, wiped it out. It was almost microscopic, this tiny little oval of aluminum in my eye that was setting up quite a racket. And I was so grateful. I paid handsomely for that, but I was glad to pay it. So glad. Thank you, thank you. He was totally equipped to get that speck out of my eye. Totally qualified. And Jesus is saying, I don't, I don't think he's telling us don't ever try to help somebody who's got an issue in their life, something that they're struggling with, something that is even hurting them badly. 
Of course we want to intervene with each other as brothers and sisters in, in the family, but even with people who don't yet know Jesus, they need somebody to step in and care about them when they're hurting. So Jesus isn't saying, you've got to have a level of perfection in your life before you can do that. No. We don't need to be perfect. We need to be humble and freely admit that, all right, I, I see something going on in your life, and I'd be glad to help you with it, and I will admit to you, I've got stuff going on in my life too. <laughs> We've all got issues, and maybe even mutually we can help each other. If I can help you, I will. I care about you, and maybe you can help me. So let's do that together. Again, it's a matter of honesty. It's a matter of humility. It's, it's a matter of communicating to somebody how much you care in the love of Christ. The other thing that we need to do as we interact with people and as we carry the flashlight of, of God's love and God's truth is we need to use that light to understand people. You know, we do so much evaluation at face value. Oh, you're this or that because of something I just make. I make this snap judgment because of an appearance. And we're, we're, we tend then to just write people off and not even make the attempt. And what we need to do is, we, if somebody is displaying behavior that we go, that is so obnoxious. <laughs> I, just, I just don't even want to be around that. Or, you know, whatever is going on that, that tends to repel us, to take the time and say, you know what, I'm going to step across that and I'm going to get to know that person. Why are they the way that they are? Why would they do such things or say such things? And it can change everything when we take the time and value someone enough to find that out. Now, we had a lady here at Parkside several years ago, and you may guess who I'm talking about. It's okay if you do. Who... Uh, she hasn't attended in, in quite a while because of health problems and uh, no means of getting here. But when she was here, if you just sized her up at, at face value, you might say, I'm not sure I want to be around her because she was um, socially challenged <laughs> as far as her ability to interact in a pleasant way. Uh, a lot of times the interactions would be very unpleasant. And would even, um, I mean, I was one of the person, people that she liked and she would threaten to hit me. Now, I think, she, I think she was kidding when she would say that, but there were times she would say it and she wasn't kidding and she would hit people. <laughs> that would happen. But if you ask somebody, how would you evaluate that person? What words would you use to describe? You might say, well, she's just, wow, she's just mean. Uh, she's awkward. She's bitter. She's angry. And so, you know, if she's over there, I think I'd rather be over here. <laughs> but what if you got to know this person and you found out what had happened in, through the course of her life? And what if you found out that um, when she was very young, her mother died and she was sexually abused by her stepfather. And so she had to leave her home at way too early of an age to get away from that and was on her own to figure life out. And the lesson she learned right there was don't trust anybody. Everybody is after something from you. So don't let them hurt you. Later on, she had a baby, and the baby died of SIDS. And then she was married, and her husband beat her so severely that she miscarried twins. Then she was married another time, and that man abandoned her, just up and left. When you have a series of hurts like that throughout life, you learn not to trust people. And you wonder whether you are 
are worthy of anybody ever loving you. And that can make you angry, and that can make you bitter, and that can make you violent, and it can make you socially awkward. But the good thing that happened in this lady's life was that she met somebody who follows Jesus, who was willing to step in and say, okay, I'm going to get your story. I'm going to find out who you are and why you are the way you are. And didn't use a gavel, but instead used the light of God's love and said, I'm going to love you no matter what. I'm going to push past a lot of gunk, and I'm going to love you because Jesus loves you. And she ended up coming to Parkside because of that, and she met other people who were willing to do that very same thing. Came to a place where the grace of God, the mercy of God, was held in a very open hand and said, here you go. You have finally found a place with people you can trust and who will love you in an unqualified way. And in 2007, I had the privilege of baptizing her into Christ. And she met the ultimate one. She knew. She knew she needed help, and she knew that was where she could find the help that she needed. And so this past week on Wednesday, I presided at her graveside. And I was able to say with full assurance, and believe me, she still went to her grave with a lot of rough edges. But there was a lot of progress in her life, too, because Jesus made a difference in her life. And in a very unqualified way, I guess I sat on a judgment seat, but I said, you know what? She's with Christ right now because she threw herself on his mercy and asked for his forgiveness and said, Jesus, please help me. You may be the only one who can. And he did. And she's now with him. And I can't wait to see her in her glorified state with all that anger and all that bitterness and all that hurt just drained out of her face and to see her in the presence of people that she can completely and totally trust and who will have will love her, do love her in the supreme and unconditional way and especially receiving the love and seeing face to face the love of Jesus Christ himself who died for her. Can't wait to see that. But love and acceptance and an offering of grace made all the difference in that woman's life. And so we need to take our lead from Jesus. Jesus said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why he came. We already stood condemned. That decision had been made a long time ago because of sin in our lives. No, the son of God came into the world that the world might be saved through him. There will be a day of judgment, but we won't be sitting on that bench. Jesus will, and he'll be making those determinations as to who steps into eternity and who doesn't, and it will be based on a relationship with him and those who have received his mercy and his grace. But for now, judgment is not taking place. For now, this is the day of salvation, the time of salvation, is, and Jesus is saying, join me. Join me in carrying out this mission to the world to lay down the gavel if you're holding one and pick up the light of salvation, the light of grace, the light of mercy, the light of the knowledge of Christ, to take that light into the world. And let's save as many people as we can while we're here. And that doesn't come about through judgment. It comes about through love and taking the time to communicate. And boy, we need that now, don't we? In our world, nobody's listening to anybody. It doesn't seem. I mean, in some corners, I guess they are. But there's an awful lot of anger, an awful lot of shouting, an awful a lot of, of making snap judgments and drawing conclusions. Nobody's talking to each other. And we're talking about some solutions, and some of them may work and they may help. But the ultimate solution comes from Jesus, who died on a cross to, to get down to the root of our problem, which is our inclination to hurt ourselves and to hurt each other because of sin in our lives. Turning away from what God says is best and what is healthy and what is righteous and what is good and what leads to life. Turning away from that, going our, on, our own way, and it never works. It never works. So we, those of us who know Jesus, we are the antidote for a sick world. And our biggest problem isn't covid our biggest problem is that there are so many people who don't yet know God through the love of Jesus. And when we get that right, you know, we worry too much about symptoms. When we get that right, all the other things start coming into place. When we learn how to love each other and value each other 
in the way that Jesus loves and values us. So we're going to take a moment now to consider what it is that Jesus did to make that possible. A very profound thing. He died on a cross. He gave his life in sacrifice to clear the way of all, all the barriers that stand between us and God and that stand between us and us to clear the way so that we can come back together so that one new humanity can be created that loves each other on the basis of the value that Jesus gives us. And so if you don't have your, your little bag or envelope, if you would get that, and there is a piece of bread in the top of that little K-cup, you can push the tab down, and when you do that, the cellophane will pop up. You peel that off, and there's a wafer there. That's the body of Christ, the bread that represents the body of Christ. And then you pull the rest of the top off, and there's the fruit of the vine, the juice that represents the blood of Christ, the ultimate sacrifice given to bring us back together with God and with each other. Jesus, I thank you for what you've done, the way that you demonstrated what true love is all about, and the way that you're willing to look past the obnoxiousness, the annoyance, the sin, the ugliness in our lives and say, you have value because I created you and you're worth dying for. Thank you for that, Jesus. And I pray that you would help us to carry that same attitude into all of our relationships with those around us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Our service today, we'll be back next week, same time, same place, and for those of you online, yeah, same, uh, same deal. Tune in at 11 o'clock and catch live streaming of Parkside Christian Church. So let's be hearers and doers of the Word. God, help us to be hearers and doers of your Word today. Amen.